Hello and welcome to I think I think this is key ship episode 7 comp response now one thing you might be wondering is why did I save up all the comp responses for Christmas for the key ship series why didn't I do them closer to the time because the series does build on it and build on each other it made sense because then it would be they'd be running together but also because I wanted to highlight the series because I knew some people would miss parts of it and Christmas is usually a good time the sort of winter period when people are they're going out for Christmas parties but also spending a lot of time in at home avoiding parties sometimes avoiding inclement weather but usually avoiding parties and therefore I'm saving it for when most people are likely to be watching there's also the fact it allows a lot of people to comment if we consider this this video came out well if we go with the newest first and we look back to the earliest comments they're seven months ago but some comments have come out have come two months ago and four months ago and therefore it's really interesting to get and be able to include those comments i've never done that so far with the common response because usually as a rule the common response has been fairly quick within a week or a turnaround and that's good for the immediate commenters but it means that i would miss out on something like this from parabellum history as a Chilean, something interesting about the Huesca videos in English-speaking YouTube is that the Battle of Incre seems like an afterthought, or a footnote at best. Here, that engagement is the first thing that comes to mind, and it's the one thing the ship is known for. Well, there is a national holiday about it, and one of its participants faces is in one of our banknotes. You won't hear much about anything else. The ship was involved in outside history buffs and nail circles. That doesn't surprise me. Popular history coming mercurial. And when I might say mean popular history, I mean the popular memory of history can be mercurial. It can be a mile deep and an inch wide in certain places. And then it can be a mile wide and inch deep in others. It's one of those things which astounds me. And I often, there seems to be not really much rhyme or reason. PR, maybe. But also, I'd say, depends on the reaction to events of people at the time. See, Inque wasn't that big a battle as far as everyone else was concerned. Other than those people in naval circles and etc. So, there wasn't the wider knowledge of it. But it was an important moment for Chile because it was an important moment in their national identity. Now, um, there was an interesting discussion here about a suggestion from... Um, okay. F.W. Skungan 208. Okay. I have no idea how to pronounce that name. But anyway, the idea was um, how we did the South America trip. Well, ship shape are sorting things out. It would help if we could have if we could all have some peace and quiet, and then we could get ahead of things. But we have our plans in place now, and we're sorting everything out. And then we're going to be announcing the next one. Next year's one is hopefully going to be Scandinavia, if everything goes to plan. Year after that, Japan year after that hopefully the crusader islands in the mediterranean we want to do some medieval naval history if we can that's the sort of ideas we have and it's not firmed up yet south america is on there south america is on there but there is also a realization that south america is going to be a very intense trip and a costly trip and we want to include other things in it i.e. perhaps some trips to the Falkland Islands 
So we're gonna have to see how that all pans out and how we can work on that. I think the South America trip, if when we start working it, will be it's kinda of like the Japan trip. It's going to take the best part of eighteen months to two years to set up for it. And I can say for uh, confidently on the Japan trip that's what it's going to take because I've started the prep work for it before we went to Australia. <laughs> I started getting together a list of people who would be able to help me communicate with museums if I needed them to and people who could put me in contact with various people and people who could act as intermediaries for us and help us arrange things started that back before we even went to Australia because it was a case of it's going to take longer than it be prepared for if we wait to see if Australia works we have to almost start it on the hope that Australia works and thank the Lord Lubber Duck Australia worked um Surprised me when a Google search, this is from Martin Howell, for hurricane deck, throw up a blank. It's a cover deck, usually at or near the top of a ship superstructure. It's one of the many names for it. Um, it's the one I've grown up with. My dad always called it that, and I have books which discuss it as that. So it could be an older term. There is always a possibility. Or it could just be a term that hasn't turned up in the Google. Okay, there are things up there, believe it or not, which don't turn up on Google. Um, that appears to be rather thin. Let's let's widen this a bit, and let's widen this a bit as well. Oh, I should start that, shouldn't I? I was going to have that auto flicking through, and I haven't. I forgot to start it. Okay, vision. Uh, most surprising thing, not that surprising since I've known this since getting Norman Freeman's US battleship as a child, is the South American navies was superior to the US Navy from 1872 to the early 1890s. Yeah. They were. Trust me, there were a fair number of US congressmen who were not happy when they found that one out. <laughs> For 20 years, they were finding out that, ooh, <laughs> Chile has more firepower than we do. Don't even look at Brazil. There always seem to be new ironclads and protected cruisers to cover. Chilean battleship Capitan Pratt is a vessel I'd like to know more about. On the Husker, it shows that the US Navy of the Civil War should have experimented more from the Ericsson Monison. More seaworthy vessels could have ser would have served as better as blockaders of the southern coast, and post-war could have shown the flag off the US Canadian Atlantic coast and Gulf Caribbean. If I was a multi-millionaire, multi I would pay for you and doc uh, you, Doctor and Drac, to visit Chile. Besides the Husker, you could also visit the recreation of the steam corvette Esmeralda, which the Husker sank at the Battle of Inque in 1879. Oh. There is a whole list of stuff for us to visit in South America. Sheep, uh, sheep in a cart. Ah, yes, the second, sixth key ship in the second key ship series. Yeah, I know. I got some of the numbers really weirdly wrong on this series. But the trouble is also I kept moving some of them around. So Huasca was originally going to be ship number four. And then it got moved about three times. It's the classic thing. It's like key ship series seven is going to start with the Dante Alighieri. And ship four is going to be the Scharnhorst class. But I keep debating ships two and three. And I'm not even going to get started on the mess that is the key naval aircraft series. Other than I probably will have to start with the Blackburn Blackburn. Just to get it out of the way. <laughs> Doc, the most surprising thing I ever learned from South American naval battle was that Uruguay defeated Brazil using cheese as ammunition on board ship. If it works, it's not stupid. It's the theory. It's the theory, anyway. I'm still working out. I'm going to have to look into that battle because I do know the one I think you're, the one you're referencing. 
and I didn't I, I must have blocked out the fact that cheese was a major part of the winning strategy I knew it was involved but I didn't realise it was a major part of the winning strategy I'll have to look into that one a bit more if you two and two, there is an Argentine warship in the capital on the river. The name escapes me in a moment. Steam-powered frigate or sloop, if memory says we're correct. I will go have a look. Hmm. Marcus from Antonium, uh, 3392. For the videos ma made, you should write a series of small books or thicker books on key ships by nation 1800s and pre-world one, as it's an interesting period of how nations use different roads and doctrines and ship designs and innovations. As each one is starting all over again, similar to aircraft development, some well, wonderful idea or second complex aircraft were created, but no one really remembers them. I have got a series, which I'm getting putting together, which are going to be a series of 45 to 55,000 word books. And I've got two, which I'm pretty much done, and I'm sorting out pictures of. Um, they're full, and when I get five minutes... Well, actually, I'll need more than five minutes to sort of, to finalise it all, and make sure I've, and sort out pictures and sort out all the things I need to do for them. They're going to be turned first into Kindle books, and then maybe into a to order print, uh, which I'm looking into. U class submarines and flag class corvettes, the Royal Navy U class. If they do well, I'm going to expand that series and wander pretty much everywhere. Basically, it doesn't really matter. I can, can I provide a 150, 200,000 word book in depth with the access to sources I have on every ship in the world? Probably not. Can I provide something that's 55,000 55, words, roughly, I was thinking on Kindle, roughly five pounds, maybe six pounds. I'm not sure that there, there's some different interesting pricing things, which means if I price it six pounds, I might get some preferential support versus five pounds. So it's, it, but it's got to be less than nine pounds for, I've been looking into this and the idea would be that sort of with the primary sources I have access to and I could get access to means I could do pretty much anything that interests me and I could produce that series at will without worrying about publishers or anyone else I like that idea I'd like that to work I'd like it to work well hopefully Because I think such a thing would be a very nice addition to the channel. But I think also such a thing would be a very nice way of getting into people's reading. It's going to be long enough that it's going to have information to worthwhile read for an evening. But it's not going to be so long, so in-depth, so complicated that it's going to be a heavy academic work. It's a fine line to walk. And when I'm happy with them and I'm happy I can pursue, I can pursue publication relatively quickly, I will be asking for people to read through. There's already some people suggested them. I'll, you know, I've got my traditional friends who are always happy to read through my work. And I'll try and get about 20 to 30 people to probably read through it. And check it all because because I am dyslexic and I know my own ability to ignore my own spelling mistakes <laughs> to read it a hundred times and never see the problem in it and the thing is if it's a correct word it might not be the correct word but it's a correct word Microsoft Word doesn't notice Well, maybe your Canadian friends should chat about HMS Mercedes more, because that was a key ship, hugely, uh, hugely, hugely important, or perhaps Ac Acacia, um, arguably the most important ship of the early 20th century after Dronaut, certainly more radical than Dronaut, sloops should be called Acacias, not sloops, mm, that's a whole debate on that one, that is a whole debate, someday I will, I could add her in, 
we'll see what happens. Key Ship Series 7, Ship 6 is currently up for debate. So Acacia could end up getting added into that. It could. He says. Ray McConnell. Do you think describing it as a monitor is accurate as she has a very high free ball for a monitor? I'm thinking the US ships being so low in the water. I don't know what an accurate description of her would be. Perhaps simply an armored ship would be more appropriate. This ship and her story have fascinated me for a long, long time. Hold on, please mate, lose the, uh, lo lo lose the cup when you make uh, these as drinking from constantly spoils of her video. That is the definition of what she was bought as. Ironclad steam monitor ran. Pretty much anything given a, a single turret was given that definition. So I'm I'm sorry, but it's not me who's made a decision. As for the drinking, sorry, I get thirsty while I'm speaking. Um, it's kind of a version of sorry, not sorry. I'm sorry you're upset, but I'm not sorry enough that I'm probably going to stop it. Because I don't really think about it. I'm used to I'm used to being a lecturer. I'm used to that stars talking, that style presenting for hours on end, and I'm used to having liquid nearby so I can take a drink. There's three reasons I have it there. One is to take a pause for people to catch up, and I've been so trained to do that that to train myself out of it would be kind of productive for when I go and do that work. Um, it, you, you take pauses so that people can catch up with their writing if they're writing notes. Believe it or not, even when you make the notes all digital download and all sorts of things, people still handwrite notes. I am dyslexic, dysgraphic. I can't read my own handwriting. So I automatically provide notes and I basically go, look, they even have notation sections down on the side so you can make scribble in extra bits but the key points are from the slides are all on these notes sort of thing and packs and uh, there are people who still write tomes. That's their way and that's fine but I don't want them getting so far behind they're getting stressed because when they start to get stressed the rest of the room will get stressed very quickly when you're dealing with hundreds of students in a room a few starting getting stressed over the place because they're not keeping up with you causes problems so you get taught certain things to slow yourself down you occasionally slow your start your, your speaking speed you take a drink you pause as if in a thought there are another couple of tricks the other reason is to take a drink is to allow students to think about what you've just said. To leave it hanging in a natural way. Because, believe it or not, if you're a lecturer, if you say something and then you just stand there looking at the students, it looks like you're asking for applause. Okay, just think about this. Um, I'm just going to say something. Uh, so, uh, cruisers were for presents. Stand there quietly, looks like I'm asking for applause. If I say, cruisers were for presents. But, you see the point. Gives you time to think, doesn't look like I'm waiting for applause. So, basically you have to deal with the fact, it's kind of like the hand gestures. I'm used to lecturing to a large space with a lot of people. So I use the hand gestures to keep attention on me. It's what I was taught to do. I was taught I don't stand behind the lectern. Um, there are people, lecturers who prefer to stand behind a lectern and just quietly speak from their notes. That's never been me. But I've always dealt with rather large groups of students. So standing behind a lectern in a fixed space means that, yeah, I'm standing there. The students in that portion can see me well, but the students over that portion can't. So I have to move. There are some lecture theatres I, I, I worked in, which are actually theatres in many ways. They have a raised, for want a better phrase of it, stage for the lecturer to walk up and down. It's a performance art in many ways, lecturing. So you have that and that style in me. And 
I suppress it to an extent for the videos, but I'm not going to try and re 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 rewrite it because I need that for when I go and do my job. So I'm sorry, but not sorry, if that makes sense. Calvin Gasberg, Calvin Gasberg, it actually dawned on me last week, but how the South American naval race affected the Monroe Doctrine at the time, especially when the collective South began to approach the USN in dreadnoughts. At various points, the Monroe Doctrine has looked rather weak and wi weak and wimpish because the South American nations were more powerful. At one point, if it hadn't been for the build-up of ships largely pushed pushed through by Teddy Roosevelt and his political arguments there would have been some serious issues as to who would have been the major powers facing off with Germany over certain nations debts in the early 1900s it might not have been America it might have had to be another South American nations. And that's one of the things we've often forgotten is that they were getting close by and that also caused pressure on the Americans to be more hard line because they had to live up to the Monroe Doctrine because they weren't looking like the tough guys at certain points. Tent Seminole, uh, Tent 7014. Afterwards, have a trip to the River Plate in Coronel and top off with a visit to Falklands. Oh, yes, we'd love to do those. Uh, Patrick, naval, the South American Naval Arms Race is so interesting. Oh, yes, it is. And the fact is, they did so much on their budgets. It was a really interesting time. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And hope you found it interesting. It's. Huasca was an interesting video to do. It really was. Take care.